Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I hope everyone is enjoying the conference thus far. Uh, my name is Rodolfo Corona. Uh, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and I am really excited to be here to introduce uh, the last, uh, but certainly not the, le the, the least keynote uh, in our lineup today. Um, sitting here with me, I have Sergey Levin, um, and I'll go ahead and introduce him before uh, he talks to us about deep reinforcement learning in robotics and autonomous decision making. Um, before I introduce Sergey, I would just like uh, to focus everyone's attention on the screen that I am sharing currently, which has slides for questions for Sergey. Uh, we are using uh, menti.com uh, with the code at the top of the screen. Um, I, I believe it will also be pinned as a message on the session's uh, chat. Um, and you can log on to that session to leave questions and especially vote for questions uh, that I can ask Sergey in the Q&A portion uh, at the end. Um, and with that, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Sergey. Um, so we're very happy to have Sergey Levine here. Uh, he received a BS and an MS in computer science from Stanford University in 2009 and a PhD in computer science from Stanford University in 2014. He joined the faculty of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at UC Berkeley in fall 2016. His work focuses on machine learning for decision making and control with an emphasis on deep learning and reinforcement learning algorithms. Applications of his work include autonomous robots and vehicles, as well as computer vision and graphics. His research includes developing algorithms for end to end training of deep neural network policies that combine perception and control, scalable algorithms for inverse reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning algorithms, and more. His work has been featured in many popular press outlets, including the New York Times, the BBC, MIT Technology Review, and Bloomberg Business. Um, Sergey, we are very honored to have you here today. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please taking it away. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and uh, also a big thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's really wonderful to be here. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in an age where uh, travel restrictions and various lockdowns often keep us uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in our homes. The one kind of good thing that perhaps is coming out of this is that the world feels smaller than it's ever been before with the, the, these online venues allowing us to uh, connect, connect from all over the world. So, you know, I guess that's maybe one positive thing we can be thankful for. All right, um, so uh, the, the topic uh, for the talk that, I, that I'd like to share with you today is deep reinforcement learning in robotics and autonomous decision making. Uh, and what I want to start with is, you know, maybe a fairly general statement that uh, many of us can agree on, uh, which is that we've seen over the past decade that deep neural networks can work very well in a range of pretty challenging scenarios, from recognizing images uh, from, you know, on the internet, to translating text, to recognizing speech. And in fact, even some of the mistakes that deep neural networks make uh, sometimes kind of makes sense. And that's, that's maybe something that, that kind of gives us a hint that there's some kind of interesting, reasonable decision-making going on behind the, behind the curtain. So here's a picture, for example, of a hummingbird feeder, uh, and it has bees on it. So the correct label is bee, but it was classified as a hummingbird. So okay, kind of a sensible mistake. Uh, this is a photograph of my uh, institution, UC Berkeley, which was classified uh, as a mosque. Uh, and it has these kind of spire bits sticking out that kind of look like maybe it could be some sort of mosque. So they're clearly mistakes, but they're the kind of mistakes that maybe like a child would make. So not something completely crazy. But do these deep neural networks really have something that we would call common sense? See, the trouble is that sometimes they make mistakes that really just seem completely ridiculous to us. And it makes us pause and wonder what's, what's going on. Um, these are some examples I borrowed from Andre Carpathi and Fei Fei Li. So this is an image captioning model. These are correct captions, a group of people standing around in a room with remotes. Uh, but sometimes they're less correct. So in the lower left is a, a toilet with a seat up in a bathroom. And in the lower right is a woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror. It's not that these are just mistakes. It's that they're, they're really the kind of mistakes that seem completely nonsensical because the, the picture in the lower left, like the significant thing about it is that there is no toilet in there. It's clearly a bathroom and so on. But uh, you know, these are not the mistakes that, that, that a child would make. Um, here, somebody inserted a, an elephant into the room and this uh, object detection model picked up on everything except for the elephant. And this is an example that I uh, borrowed from Leon Batu of a detector of people making a call. 
Uh, and what this detector figured out is that people making a call uh, is the label that it should assign when there's a telephone with a person in close proximity without actually paying attention to whether that person is actually speaking on the phone. And that's a, a reasonable statistical inference because usually when there's a phone and a person, they're making a call, but it's not the correct kind of causal relationship. So uh, we could say that, well, something is kind of really amiss with these things. Like they're just making these crazy mistakes, completely unreasonable. But we could think, you know, ask this question, how is it that, that we're able to do it? Why is it that for humans, these kinds of mistakes would just never really happen? Well, I think that part of the answer lies in the difference between the structure of the world that we inhabit and the world that deep neural networks inhabit. So what does our universe look like? You know, our universe has galaxies, physics, uh, objects that we interact with, complex open world environments, other agents. So these are all things that characterize our, our universe. What about the universe of the image captioning model? Well, you could say that the image captioning model looks at images uh, of uh, you know, our universe, right? So in a sense, maybe its universe is the same. Like it also gets to see open world environments. It also gets to see objects. The trouble is that the rules that govern the image captioning universe are actually completely different. It looks similar, but it's actually different. Because as far as the image captioning model is concerned, the way the world works is that you get an image, you output a, a phrase, and then you get a different unrelated image. And this is repeated over and over again. So while the images look like our world, the mechanics of this image captioning universe are completely disconnected from how our world works. And I think this is the explanation for why these models appear to lack common sense, because in their universe, they don't need that common sense. We need it in our universe because our universe works the way it does. So perhaps common sense, what we call common sense, emerges from embodied and situated learning. And because these models are not embodied and not situated in our world, they get this kind of weird alien uh, re reasoning mechanism that makes mistakes about teddy bears and uh, toilets. Now, the title of the talk was about reinforcement learning. So you might think at this point that I'm going to just be telling you that reinforcement learning is going to be kind of the answer to all of this. Uh, reinforcement learning, the way that it is done today, basically models an agent that interacts with the world, actively collects a little bit of experience, uses that to modify its behavior, its model, and then collects more experience. Uh, but by itself, I think this is not quite the entirety of the answer. Uh, so if we look at the domains where reinforcement learning algorithms have been very successful, we've seen really impressive results for example, for uh, playing uh, video games, simple robotic control tasks, and beating the world champion at Go, fairly challenging things, but they look very different still from our universe or even from the kind of open world settings where deep neural networks have been successful in the supervised domain. There is a big gap between these things, and it's really the difference between open world and closed world settings. So current reinforcement learning methods really do very well in closed world settings with known, well-understood rules, like playing a game, but have, been, have proven to be pretty challenging to scale up to open world settings. And if we really want common sense to emerge through embodied and situated learning, we need this to happen in open world settings that actually demand common sense. Uh, one uh, very uh, nice concept that I think illustrates this point is something called Moravec's paradox. I'll illustrate Moravec's paradox with an example, and then I'll tell you what it is. So in 1996, uh, for the first time in history, a computer defeated the world champion at chess. So this is uh, Garry Kasparov, and here he is playing against the robot. Uh, but in this picture, there is no robot. So the machine is playing chess, that's what's on the screen there, but a person is still moving the pieces. Fast forward 20 years, 2016, for the first time in, in history, a machine defeats the world champion at Go. Uh, now, surely in 20 years, we'll have a robot actually doing this, but we zoom out and in fact, there's a gentleman uh, wearing a, a nice suit, moving the pieces, and he's not a very sophisticated cyborg. This is in fact also a human being. Uh, and even then we can't get the machine to actually move the pieces. So Moravec's paradox basically says that when it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, the hard things are easy and the easy things are hard. That is to say, things that we find cognitively tricky and demanding are often actually not too hard for machines like complex algebra, calculus, and playing chess. Whereas the things that we find second nature, like moving the pieces, are actually very difficult for a machine to master.
So reinforcement learning alone doesn't guarantee success in open world settings. In order to basically figure out the easy stuff, we need something more. I think that open world problems also require broad experience. And reinforcement learning causes some trouble in this setting. So remember that in reinforcement learning, the agent interacts with the world, collects some experience, improves its understanding of the world, collects more experience and repeats. And this is done many, many times. But if you want broad experience, if you want kind of image net level generalization with uh, huge open world settings, then every time you go around this reinforcement learning loop, you need to collect a large data set of experience at the scale of ImageNet. And imagine if you had a system that had to collect ImageNet, update the model, throw it in the garbage, and then collect it all over again. That would never be a practical approach. So we, we, we need to, uh, you know, how can we generalize effectively without being able to train on large data sets? I think we can't. We need to sort of uh, uh, rethink this formula so that we can have embodied and situated learning and still have large data sets. And I think a better embodied learning recipe, and one that I'll discuss in today's talk, is where we gather a large data set from past interactions, whatever it is that the machine had to do before, maybe your robot had to do the cooking, uh, clean the, the room and so on, and then use that data to train for many epochs to acquire the best behavior we can for the new problem, and then occasionally get a little bit more data to sort of fine tune. And it really needs to be this kind of uh, lifelong large data set, multitask view of embodied and situated learning. And in order to get to, to this kind of scale, I think autonomy is really crucial. Uh, so what could go wrong with this formula? Well, we could ask, does someone need to supervise the agent during this entire learning process? If someone needs to do that, that's going to put a limit on the breadth of experience they can collect because that requires human effort. Does a person need to define each task manually? That would limit how many tasks you can have, which in turn would limit uh, the scale. And is the learning and deployment itself automated or does someone need to kind of babysit the machine uh, as it acquires behaviors? Uh, if so, that would also limit the amount of experience to collect. So this procedure has to be really as, as automated as possible in order to scale. And every part of the process has to improve as we get more data and experience. And any part that doesn't improve could eventually become the bottleneck. That could eventually be the thing that holds it back. So as a corollary, any manual part of this loop uh, will eventually become the bottleneck because that's the part that won't improve from data. Um, so to kind of summarize the motivation here, what I'd really like to talk about today is how we can go from this kind of artificial universe of the supervised learning model to something that looks more like our universe. Learning from interaction is going to provide the grounding, what we would call common sense, and learning from large data sets of prior experience could provide the generalization. And all of this needs to be autonomous in order to scale. So of course, we can't do all of this just yet. But what I'm going to tell you about today is a little, a little bit of work that we've done that I think begins to approach some of these ideas. I'll talk about how robots can learn skills from large amounts of experience that generalize in realistic settings. So how we can move RL from cl closed world to more open world environments. How we can make real world embodied learning fully autonomous. So remove as much of the human involvement as possible so that the machine learns on its own and therefore can scale. And then I'll conclude with a more speculative discussion about whether RL agents can learn from experience without any hand-designed objectives or rewards at all to remove that barrier to scale. So let's start with the first topic. Uh, what do we need in order to have machines that learn directly in the real world from their own experience? And we're, we're going to really talk about robots here, but I think a lot of these ideas can apply beyond robotics as well. Well, we need well-defined tasks that the agent can practice. So for now, we'll define the task manually, and I'll talk about how to automate that part later. We need the ability to collect experience without human effort. The robot really has to be able to supervise itself from its own experience and learn about what actually works or what doesn't work, because otherwise the human effort is going to really be the main barrier to scale. And we need a learning algorithm that, that itself can scale effectively to large off-policy data sets. So things that the robot has collected in the past need to be useful to improve its behavior in the future. And this is really not optional. Basically, nothing will work without this. So we've got to get this part right first. So one experiment that we ran that gets at this point uh, is uh, this was some work that we did uh, at Google a couple of years back uh, called QTOpt. And our goal with QTOpt was to really see if, if deep reinforcement learning can be scaled up to open world settings to solve an actual useful uh, robotics task. So in this experiment, we had 
a number of robots actually working together to collect a shared data set so that we get enough data to effectively generalize and a kind of hybrid offline online system where all data from past experience was stored to disk, reloaded by the system, and then additional online data was collected as it went to kind of patch up the mistakes. So this is kind of a large scale parallelized system. The mathematical basis for this, which I won't go into too much detail on, is basically a, a very, very scaled up version of the Q-learning algorithm. So if you've heard of Q-learning or dynamic programming, it's basically the same idea, just uh, scaled up to work with these large neural nets and large amounts of data. What I think is, is, is more interesting to discuss is basically the problem set up and what the system ended up doing. So we trained it on about 1,000 training objects uh, and about 600,000 grasp attempts. So this took us several months to collect uh, with a Q function network with 1.2 million parameters. And this is a, a huge network by RL standards and a tiny network by computer vision standards. So it kind of ended up landing somewhere in the middle. But importantly, the only grasping specific feature that was needed to make this work was the reward, which was just one if something was grasped correctly and uh, zero otherwise. And with the system, we could then see what sorts of behaviors would emerge. Uh, these were not behaviors that were programmed. The robot was just trying to pick up objects, but it automatically learned things like how to react to a perturbation, like if somebody pushed uh, the object out of the way. So here you can see that someone pushes the tennis ball out of the gripper. The robot actually adjusts and it knows how to do this automatically from the reinforcement learning process. Uh, the system could pick up objects that were large, small, uh, transparent, etc. So it could really generalize to a wide range of settings. And th that's the generalization that we want to see for these open world problems. On a large test that set with a wide variety of uh, previously unseen objects, the success rate was 96%. And the 4% of failures were all on this uh, rubber octopus. So if we, if it wasn't for the rubber octopus, it would be even better. But, uh, you know, we'll have to wait for the next iteration to grasp the rubber octopus. Okay, now you could say that this kind of evaluation is still somewhat closed and that's in a, it's in a laboratory. So the, the objects are unseen objects, but the environment is a seen environment. So we could uh, take things a bit further. So this is some work that was done by my student, uh, Gregory Kahn this year. Uh, and what Greg wanted to do is study how reinforcement learning could enable robotic navigation in open world settings. So we took this uh, robot, it's uh, called the Jackal, uh, made by ClearPath Robotics. And what we wanted it to do is to learn how to navigate outdoor environments by uh, minimizing the bumpiness of the ride in order to stay on, on paths and also avoiding collisions. So we can see on the left are predictions that the self-supervised uh, model is making about whether it'll have a, a, a smooth ride. So if it stays on the path, it'll be smooth. If it goes on the grass, it'll be rough. And on the right side, you can see predictions about collision. And here again, you can see the, the candidate trajectories turn red when it thinks that those will result in a collision. The method is actually very simple. Uh, there is a recurrent neural network that takes as input the current image observation and a sequence of candidate future actions. And then it predicts for those actions, will we get bumpiness and will we get collision? So you can train this with uh, uh, data that the robot collects itself, labeled using basically its onboard accelerometers. So it's an automated process that doesn't require uh, very much human involvement. Occasionally the robot gets stuck in a, in a ditch and then someone has to uh, rescue it, but otherwise it's mostly automatic. And one of the things we wanted to see is whether we would get some kind of, let's say, navigational common sense. So I motivated a lot of this by talking about common sense. Uh, what is navigational common sense? Well, it means that you understand that navigation and dr driving off-road is not just about geometry. It's really about whether something is traversable. As a, at some level, it's a semantic concept. So for example, if you're in a grassy field, there's tall grass in front of you. So if you just reason about the world in terms of geometry, you'll think the grass is impassable. But with reinforcement learning, you can figure out that it's okay to drive through the grass, as you can see for the method on the right, because it's done it before. So it successfully saw grass in front of it, drove straight and got through it. So it knows that that's okay. Whereas on the left, a purely geometric baseline method, basically it attempts to find a path where there's no grass in the way at all using LIDAR and just can't find one because the grass is everywhere. So it's a kind of navigational common sense. Um, some obstacles are traversable like grass and some are not like walls. It also learned that concrete paths 
are good to avoid bumpiness. So here there are no concrete paths, but the video will, will switch shortly and you'll see uh, kind of a more, whoops, sorry, a more urban environment. Let me just play that again. So here is a more urban environment where there are concrete paths and it figured out on its own that the concrete paths are how you avoid bumpiness. So it wasn't told about that. It just had to figure that out from its own accelerometers. Okay, so um, for the next part of the talk, what I'd like to discuss is how we can automate this process better. So, so far uh, we had to you know, set up these tasks in the right way so they could collect data autonomously, but in general in robotics, it's a major challenge. What does it take to run reinforcement learning in the real world? Uh, a few years back, we had the, these experiments where we had a robotic hand opening a door, and we're pretty happy with this because the robot could figure out this task on its own, but we needed to assign it a reward for opening the door. So what did we do? Well, as good engineers, we installed a little encoder inside the door that measured the angle, and that was kind of neat. It was a fun hardware hack, but of course, your home and my home doesn't have encoders attached to our doors, so this robot really can only learn in the lab. It can't go and learn in someone's home. Uh, here, another experiment also on door opening. This was uh, some work done at Google uh, led by Ali Yaya. And here you can see the robots are learning to open the doors, but Ali has to come around and close the doors for them. So someone has to reset the environment to enable the machine to try again. And this might seem like a small thing, but it's a lot of work. Uh, more recently, my student Anusha Nagabandi conducted some experiments on getting a robotic hand to manipulate multiple objects in a palm. Uh, and we were pretty happy that the robot could learn this entirely in the real world. As a, as a labor-saving measure, what Anusha did is she programmed a second robot to reset the environment when the uh, hand dropped the, the balls. So, uh, of course, again, it's kind of clever, but it requires a lot of manual effort to set these up. And remember that we need autonomy in order to scale. So all these additional manually designed hardware hacks are getting in the way of the autonomy, which in turn is getting in the way of scale. So here's one idea. What if multitask learning could be the key to learning in the real world by allowing us to automate this process? Uh, let's imagine that you have a robot and that robot needs to learn how to use a coffee machine. So perhaps we have task one. Task one is put cup, cup in coffee machine. And maybe the robot attempts it, drops the cup, and now someone has to come and fix it. it seems like a very mundane, uh, problem, but of course this gets in the way of scale. We don't want to have require a person to do this. What if we have a second task? What if we have a second task, which is for the robot to pick up a cup? So perhaps if you attempt task one and fail, you can try task two. And if you succeed at that, you can try task one again. If you fail, you try task two again. If you succeed at putting the cup in the coffee machine, maybe you can replace the cup. If you fail and you spill the coffee, maybe you can clean up the coffee spill. So in a real world setting, if we're willing to admit a multitask formulation of the problem, this issue can actually go away and every failure can be an opportunity to practice a new skill. And I think this could be a really powerful idea to automate learning in the real world. We explored a variant of this a while back in, a, in some early work. This was led by uh, Wei Chao Han, who's now at uh, MIT. And uh, what well, Weichow design is a kind of graph for uh, a few simple robotic manipulation tasks. So here the robot is trying to learn to pick up this wrench and uh, it has a, a reaching task followed by picking tasks at different locations. And then each time it succeeds at a pick, it's an opportunity for it to practice placing the object in different places. Um, he also devised a more sophisticated task and you can guess kind of what the task graph here looks like we have to pick up the wrench and, uh, and tighten this nut. And uh, you can see the numbers on the screen indicating which control the robot is using. So if it fails at one of the tightening turns, then it goes back and tries it again. So it's kind of a simple idea, but it turns out to be a powerful idea that we can apply in a number of other settings. So here's some much more recent work. This was led by Sahun Ha on learning to walk in the real world. So we have this quadrupedal robot called the Minotaur, and it's going to have uh, two tasks, walking forward and backward. And it's also going to have a task for standing up after a fall. So the idea is that if it was just learning to walk forward, if it runs off the end of the arena, someone need to bring it back so it can try again. But when it has two tasks, it can stay in the center. So it has two tasks. If it falls, it stands back up. And if it gets to the edge, then it switches to the other task. And as a result, the learning process is entirely automated. So you can turn it on. Uh, this is a, you know, the full recording is several hours long, 
but the robot is learning entirely autonomously. So it just keeps walking forward, backward. When it falls, it stands back up and it keeps going forward, backward, forward, backward. And after 72 minutes, it's actually discovered a walking gait entirely on its own without having anybody program it. Now, of course, the interesting thing about discovering these kinds of behaviors automatically is that besides just learning to walk on flat ground, as you saw here, um, you can also, well, first you can look at the interesting emergent uh, gates. So for some reason, the, the forward walk ended up being very different from the backward walk. The robot is just a little asymmetric. The feet are actually angled in one direction. And as a result, different gates are optimal forward and backward. But what's maybe more interesting is that you can then put the robot on a different surface, like the soft mattress, run the process again. It takes longer because this, this surface is harder. And then the robot will discover a new way to walk that is better suited to the surface. So this is a, a soft mattress. Uh, we can also put it on, um, uh, we can also put it on a different surface. So we have um, this uh, mat with little crevices where the feet get stuck. So here the optimal strategy is to shake the feet a lot so it pulls them out of the little holes. And that's also discovered automatically. And we can also add more tasks. So here we have a policy that was trained with four tasks, forward, backward, left, and right. And then the resulting skills can actually be controlled with a game controller to actually pilot the robot uh, to get it to walk to different places entirely with learned skills discovered automatically. Okay, uh, what if we only have one goal? So, so far we had to provide these different tasks manually. So what, when the tasks are provided, then the learning is automatic, but the definition of the task is provided manually. What if we had only one task? Maybe we have a, a robot and we wanted to push this cup uh, to the white circle. So, you know, serve up the cup, it's like a robot bartender. Now, the trouble, of course, is that if we manually reset the cup to different places, we're actually telling the robot some additional information. We're telling it, you need to be able to push the cup from all of these different locations. If we don't give it that, no that knowledge, then the robot actually doesn't know how to, the, the, this, uh, this piece of information will just push the cup to the goal and stay there forever and eventually unlearn the skill. So one of the ways we can uh, address this is we can design additional tasks automatically. So we call this the perturbation controller. The robot attempts a task, and then there's a second controller that attempts to perturb that task. So if you want to reach the yellow star, you attempt to reach the yellow star, and then this other controller pushes you away and puts you somewhere new, and then you attempt to reach the yellow star again. The perturbation controller will actually be learned together with the forward policy, and its reward function will be to visit new states. So you run the policy, the policy tries to do the task, and then you run the perturbation controller, which is attempting to reach some state that has not been reached before. And that will actually force the forward policy to learn a variety of behaviors. So that at test time, when the environment is in a new state, it'll know what to do. So here's an evaluation of this. We set up this uh, little three-finger three claw robot, and the, the task will be for the robot to push the beads on an abacus so the two are on the left and two are on the right from any initial configuration. So for whatever configuration they're in now, push them so two are on the left and two are on the right. We're going to be learning from raw image observations. The rewards will be defined by an image classifier and there will be no manual resets. So here is a recording of the entire training process. This is the manual part. Here, a person put the beads two on the left and two on the right and is collecting examples for the classifier. So this is gonna define the reward. This is the only manual part and it takes a few minutes. So now the reward is learned the uh, Henry here is gonna give it the thumbs up and then the robot runs. And it's what it's doing here in this fast forward video is alternating between the forward policy, trying to move the beads apart and running the perturbation controller, which attempts to reach a new state. Halfway through, we give it a midterm exam. It's kind of okay, but not great. Uh, and then we uh, leave it running for longer. So the training process is completely automated. It takes about 25 hours total, but during those 25 hours, Henry can, uh, can go home, he can take a nap, he can do his homework, all while the robot is, is learning um, on its own. And then when it's done, it can actually perform the task from a wide range of different initial configurations, again, entirely from images. It's kind of slow, it's not perfect, but it does get it right each time. So we can see how multitask learning and maybe even automatically generating tasks can help automate the robotic learning process. So in the last portion of this talk, what I'm going to talk about is how we can 
automate task construction completely? Can we have RL agents that learn from their own experience without any hand design goals and actually acquire useful knowledge that will let them behave intelligently in the real world? So what if we have no supervision at all? Well, can we have agents that invent their own tasks to practice in order to learn about the world? And then after that unsupervised interaction, can they adapt this knowledge to solve some new task? This is not unlike how a human child learns, right? Uh, children, if you, if you watch a child play, they're not just doing random things. They're not moving their body in random ways. They're actually thinking about things to try in the world, going after those things, attempting them, and then maybe moving on to something new. So we'd like to have a robot that will do something a, a little bit like this. We can learn without any rewards at all if we can generate our own goals. So step one will be to generate a goal. And we'll say that a goal is basically a state. So if we're learning from images, then a goal is an image. So we'll, we'll build a generative model that generates images that we can use as goals. The particular generative model that we will use is something called a variational autoencoder, although any generative model could work, including GANs, any generative model that, you, that you're familiar with. There are many other choices. So the robot is essentially going to hallucinate images and set those images as goals. Uh, in a variational autoencoder, you have a latent code, Z, the robot will sample Z, and then we'll sample an image given Z. That's just the generative process for a VAE. And then we'll attempt to reach that goal with our policy. So we have a policy, now it's conditioned on the current image X and the goal XG, and we'll attempt to reach that. And the data that the policy collects when it attempts to reach a goal will be used to update the goal generator, will update the generative model, and it'll also update the policy with RL. So that's the process. Set a goal, attempt the goal, use the resulting data to improve the goal generator, and then use the resulting data to also improve your policy, and then repeat. Now, there's a little bit of a problem with this recipe, which is that if you just update your goal generator with data that you saw while attempting the goals that you generated, you will start to focus in on the things that you know how to do well. So if I'm trying to pick up a cup and I picked up the cup correctly, I'll add that data and I'll generate more goals for picking up cups and ignore other things. So intuitively, what you want to do is you want to take the goals that are harder to reach and select them more often. So if you imagine this little cartoon 2D navigation scenario, after uh, we've reached different locations, we'd like to take those rare locations, the ones that seem like we're not reaching them as often, and skew our distribution so that we upweight them, so that we set those as goals more often. Uh, and if we do this, and then we refit our goal generator to the skewed distribution, which upweights the rare goals, then we can broaden the support of goals that we can reach. And in fact, you can actually prove that with an appropriate choice of skewing function, this can result in a uniform distribution at the end, which means that you'll be able to reach uh, all the possible states that exist, provided that your reinforcement learning process is successful. So here's a video of, uh, of this in action. It's a, it's a little bit blurry, but hopefully you can all see that. Uh, this is a robotic uh, control experiment where we took a robot and we put it in front of a door. Now, we didn't tell it what to do, but of course, the situation is a little suggestive. If you're in front of the door, what do you do? Well, you can move your hand, and then you'll get bored with that quickly because it's easy to move your hand everywhere. But then once you accidentally open the door, now you see a very unusual image. You see an open door, which you've never seen before, and then you start setting that as the goal repeatedly, which starts to happen at around 10 to 15 hours. And then after 25 hours of training, the robot can actually open this door pretty consistently. So then at the end, we administer a test where a person actually sets the goal images. And the goal here is shown in the bottom right. And we, we're going to walk it through a series of goals that require it to open the door to all of the different angles. So we first ask it to open a little, then a little more, and so on. And we test that each time it reaches an end result that looks very similar to the commanded goal. So this is, in this way, the robot is able to use what it learned from the unsupervised phase. What is the objective for this method? Well, we're trying to broaden the range of goals that we can reach. So the objective, uh, in part, is the entropy of the goal distribution. So entropy quantifies how broad a distribution is. We want the broadest distribution possible. So it's entropy of P of G. But what does RL do? Well, let's say your policy, pi of A given S comma G, is trained to reach the goal G. As pi gets better, the final state S will be closer to G which means that P of G given S 
becomes more deterministic. Essentially, as your policy gets better, it's easier to guess what goal it was going for based on what state it reached. If the policy is perfect, the goal was the state it reached. So what that means is that in addition to maximizing the goal entropy, this method is also minimizing the conditional entropy of the goal given the state. Reach as many possible goals, but the goal you're going for should be predictable from the state that you actually reached. And from information theory, we know that this is actually exactly the equation for the mutual information between S and G, which is quite an appealing mathematical formalism. It says you want high mutual information between the state you reached and the goal, and that will cause you to learn to reach all possible goals. So maximizing the mutual information leads to good exploration because of the first term and effective goal reaching because of the second term. And we discuss this formalism a little bit more in the paper at the bottom of the slide. But at the end, for the last portion of this talk, let me ask kind of a conceptual question. Should we seek out surprise or diversity? Is that actually the right objective for this kind of exploration process? So, so far I talked about how you can identify these unusual states and upweight them. And the conventional wisdom is that unsupervised RL should be intrinsic motivation, which is basically novelty seeking. And we're not the first to come up with this idea. This has been explored in a number of previous works going back a very long time on uh, intrinsic motivation, surprise seeking, and so on. But is this a good idea in realistic environments? So the, you know, this talk really is about realistic environments and common sense. Is this what we want in realistic environments? In reinforcement learning benchmark domains, the kind that we often study when we do RL research, like this little half cheetah domain, nothing really happens unless the agent executes a coordinated series of actions. So you basically have to do something in order to see a surprising state. But in the real world, that's often not the case. If you have an actual cheetah instead of the half cheetah, you know, some days you're going to hunt the gazelle and some days some other animal is going to chase you. Surprising things happen in the real world, even if you don't do anything to seek them out. So agents in realistic environments, maybe they don't need to seek out surprise. Maybe surprising things happen on their own. And maybe the challenge in realistic settings is rather to maintain homeostasis, to avoid the bad surprises to keep yourself in states where you're comfortable and have the things you need to survive. This is a little bit of a philosophical statement, but maybe based on this statement, we can devise an actual reinforcement learning algorithm. And that's what we did in this paper called Surprise Minimizing RL in Dynamic Environments. So the idea here is that we want agents that learn to maintain homeostasis. And the agent has a belief about the kinds of states that are familiar to it, P theta of S. So maybe the agent is playing Tetris and empty Tetris boards are more familiar because that's where the game starts. So it likes these kinds of board states and these kinds of states are unusual and unfamiliar. It'll observe a state and it will update its beliefs. So it'll update its beliefs to assign the highest log probability to all the states seen so far. And then it will take an action. And its reward upon taking that action is the log probability of the next state it sees. So it wants to take actions so that it sees a familiar state. But crucially, this agent understands that its actions will not just produce new states, but its actions will also change its own beliefs. So it could choose to go to an unusual state for the sake of changing its beliefs so that that state is more, more familiar and so that it can stay there. Let me give you an example. Uh, it's kind of a slightly fanciful example. Let's say that you have a robot and it's outside and it's in the sun and in the rain and everything is changing around it. And it goes and builds a house. Now, the first time it builds that house, it's very surprising. It's never seen a house before. But when it goes inside the house, it has a more stable environment where there are fewer surprising things. So if it has that long horizon reasoning, if it understands that its actions will change its beliefs, then it might take actions that initially lead to unusual states for the sake of stabilizing itself in a more narrow range of states later. So it seeks out comfortable, familiar uh, environments or ones that it can get familiar with. And it turns out that this uh, simple principle actually leads to interesting behaviors in a number of kind of simple video game style environments. So for example, this algorithm can learn to play Tetris without knowing the objective of Tetris because minimizing surprise in Tetris means clearing the board because if blocks pile up, you'll see lots of very unusual states, but if you keep the board clean, then you get uh, kind of the, these very familiar states. It can learn to play some video games. So this is a video game based on Doom. It's actually the VizDoom benchmark task. And again, without any 
uh, reward function, this agent kind of learns to play the game because uh, it sees very unusual states when it gets hit by the by the enemies or when the enemies get close to it. So it wants to keep them away to avoid nasty surprises. Um, you can also get this algorithm to learn to balance at the edge of a cliff. So if you put this little humanoid at the edge of a cliff and give them a push, uh, the surprise minimization will learn to avoid that push because falling leads to lots of very surprising states. Uh, and of course, this can be verified quantitatively. Now, in a sense, we of course did select these tasks so that you know, their task for surprise minimization leads to meaningful behavior. But my claim would be that a lot of realistic environments actually have these properties, that in a lot of realistic environments, if you don't do anything meaningful, then surprising things will just happen to you. And you have to actually take active action to maintain homeostasis. And maybe this could be a principle for unsupervised reinforcement learning. OK, so to conclude, I talked about how robots can learn from large amounts of experience and generalize. So we can actually get RL out into open world settings. We can make it more autonomous by using multitask principles to automate the learning process. And potentially, we could even get rid of the need for human specification of objectives with some of the principles I discussed in the last section of the talk. So the, the, the main kind of message that I want to get across uh, is that learning from interaction has the potential to provide that grounding, that common sense that can overcome some of the issues we've seen uh, with deep nets and other fields. Learning from large data sets of prior experience could provide for the generalization and learning autonomously is what can make all this scale. Uh, so where is all this going? Well, if we want uh, kind of big multitask learning problems uh, for, for autonomous agents, we need a scalable way to define tasks or simply invent them. We need efficient and scalable off-policy RL algorithms. And there's still major challenges in that area. So if you're interested in working in this, uh, in this field, that's a great area for topics to tackle. Uh, and we need to, you know, when we occasionally go and get more data, that needs to be unattend unattended, autonomous, uh, and fully automated. And again, I think there are big open challenges there to tackle as well. I'd like to thank all the students that were involved in this work uh, and thank all of you for listening. And I'd be happy to take questions. Um, wonderful. Uh, th thank you so much, Sergey, for, for such an exciting talk. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's really exciting to see the field like moving forward into more embodied uh, real world settings uh, like the ones that you've described. Um, Anyways, uh, to, to move forward, uh, we have about 15 minutes left in the session, uh, which we'll go ahead and use for questions. Uh, at this moment, I'd also encourage people that if you do have any questions that you haven't posted, uh, please go on the menti.com uh, site to post them right now. Um, OK, so I, I guess I'll, I'll just start reading uh, from here on what's floated up. Um, so one question that's on here is, um, Many labs in Latin America are financially strained due to COVID and other factors. Are there areas or problems in RL that you think are ripe for labs with few computational resources? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I want to separate my answer into two parts. The first part about reinforcement learning and the second part about robotics in particular. These are both fields where kind of financial considerations can be a barrier for entry. Uh, in reinforcement learning, it's more about compute. In robotics, it's more about equipment. So when it comes to reinforcement learning, you know, there are some reinforcement learning problems that are very hard to work on without access to lots of compute. Like if you want to do large scale, image based, whatever, or if you want to beat the benchmark on, on Atari games, that's going to require a lot of compute. But I do think that one of the things that the reinforcement learning community has done reasonably well is that we, we do have a number of accepted benchmarks that are substantially smaller benchmarks that uh, don't require images, that don't require conv nets. Uh, it's, that's, it's rarer to see that in like NLP or vision, but in RL that, that does exist. And also reinforcement learning is a field that is in some ways less mature. So in a computer vision, we kind of, you know, have like pretty good algorithms and we're kind of innovating on models and in NLP, you know, we kind of know sort of the kind of algorithms we're gonna use. In RL, it's much more kind of a wild west. So there's, that means that there's a lot more room for new algorithmic ideas with solid theory evaluated on simpler problems. And I do think the community has in large part been accepting of that, although there's always some you know, awkwardness, maybe someone will ask you to run 500 random seeds, but so long as you kind of resist that, that uh, I do think that there's a lot of room for clever original research evaluated at a smaller scale. Uh, you know, certainly I would love to see research like that, and I think that that is happening. So that's on the reinforcement learning algorithm side. 
the robotics side, you know, robotics has had issues with barrier to entry for, for decades, right? Uh, you know, it used to be that if you were doing robotics in like the 1990s, you need, you know, a $5 million robot just to get started. That's actually something that I see changing a lot recently. So, you know, something that makes, that hits very close to home for me right now, uh, here at, at Berkeley, a lot of us are working from home, uh, which means that students are doing robotics experiments are doing those experiments at home. What are they using? Well, they're using uh, kind of hobbyist robotic arms that they can buy using off the shelf servos that cost a small fraction of what uh, industrial robots cost. So, you know, if you're in the United States, uh, an industrial robot would, would run you something like 30,000 US dollars. A hobbyist arm can, can range from $200 to $1,000. Still not cheap, but way cheaper than, than it used to be. Uh, and I think that learning is actually making it easier to use low cost robotics hardware, because if you have conventional optimal control techniques, they really require very uh, high performance robots, learning methods, reinforcement learning, it kind of doesn't care. So that means that you can use cheaper robots and still run interesting and scientifically meaningful experiments. And we've released a few papers uh, on kind of uh, robotics benchmark suites that use lower cost hardware. Uh, which you can look look up. One of them is called RepLab. Another one is called Robel, uh, and they both provide recipes for how to build cheaper uh, robots uh, that uh, you know could be useful for experimenting at home. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. It, it's encouraging to hear because, um, yeah, I guess sometimes it does feel like one needs you know a data center and access to a GPU cluster in order to you know opt into into contributing to the community. Um, okay, so the next question we have is, um, do you think that deep reinforcement learning can truly surpass uh, traditional control methods in robotics? And in what context do you think that this can be done? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So I, I do think that uh, the, the sort of pragmatic answer depends a lot on the domain. There are some domains where uh, model-based optimal control works really well. Uh, like, for example, if you want to launch a rocket, uh, probably you're going to be using uh, model-based optimal control techniques because characterizing the physics of the rocket is you know, not that difficult. We kind of have good ways of doing it. Uh, and uh, conventional model-based optimal control techniques will produce well-understood answers. If your problem is convex, you can provide guarantees on that answer. But where things will break down is when complex open world uh, issues start to get into the mix, especially perception, but not just perception, perception, messy physics, basically things that are unpredictable. When you have something that, that is unpredictable, then modeling it is manually is a very risky proposition because when you model it manually, you're relying on your own ingenuity to capture all the possible outcomes. And that's where learning methods would really shine. So from a purely pragmatic standpoint, I would say, if you're launching a rocket, use optimal control. If you're building a robot to fold laundry, you should probably use learning. And the, the bits where things get really complicated is, is for the in-between problems. Like for example, autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is a great in-between problem because the mechanics uh, of a car are, are well characterized, but the behavior of other cars on the road, pedestrians and so on, are extremely poorly characterized. So that's one of those things where, you know, a lot of the most successful techniques today actually use a combination of learning and optimal control. And perhaps we'll see that for, for a while. Longer term, I actually think that learning and optimal control are not really diametrically opposed things. Like in a sense, you can think of reinforcement learning as uh, taking optimal control formalisms and combining them with data. So I, I, you know, in my own research, I actually don't see those as, as two opposing viewpoints. I actually see, you know, my work, for example, as putting learning into control. I see. Uh, th thank you very much for that answer. Um, I, I think what would be a related question that's also on here, or at least somewhat related, is um, that sometimes it feels like model-based reinforcement learning is the same as model predictive control. Uh, how would you differentiate between the two? Good question. So model predictive control uh, refers to uh, a way of uh, controlling a dynamical system where you optimize a new plan or a new controller at every time step. Model-based reinforcement learning refers to a way of controlling a dynamical system where you learn a dynamics model. So you can do model predictive control with known models or learned models, 
and you can do model-based reinforcement learning with model predictive control or with something else. So essentially model predictive control is a way to use a model for control. Uh, there are other ways too, but that's one of them. Model-based reinforcement learning focuses on ways to get the model that you can then use for control in a number of different ways. I see. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Um, uh, another question that we have on here is, uh, what would you suggest would be approaches, uh, and I think this relates to the question of exploration NRL, um, what, what would be the approach for processes that cannot afford to fail a lot of times? Uh, for example, chemical processes or, uh, you know, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question uh, because that, that, that's actually a problem that's been on my mind very much, uh, you know, lately, uh, the past year or so. Um, so I didn't talk about this too much in this talk, but I, but something that I alluded to, I think, is part of the key here. So. If you remember, I discussed how in order to get generalization, we need large data sets, and you don't want to collect large data sets each time you learn a new policy, so you want to reuse lots of data from past tasks. That, I think, could also be part of the key for these safety critical systems. Instead of thinking about reinforcement learning as fundamentally an active process where you try, refine, try again, we can think of it instead as a process of turning data into decision makers. So you can get past data of your chemical plant, whatever policy was running, analyze that past data and distill it into a better decision rule. And this is sometimes referred to as batch reinforcement learning or offline reinforcement learning. And I think that's actually a very powerful idea. It hasn't gotten as much attention um, kind of in the past decade, largely because of the focus on simulated tasks like video games. But I think for real world reinforcement learning, learning just from data without that active cycle could actually be really, really powerful because it avoids the need to build simulators and it avoids the need to run unsafe, partially trained policies. So I think when it comes to chemical plants, um, medical applications, maybe even driving, we might see a kind of a revolution of offline reinforcement learning in the next few years what, once these algorithms become more mature and people start applying them to a much wider range of problems than previous RL methods. I see, uh, thank you. Um, uh, another question that we have on here is, um, is reinforcement learning used uh, in practice and engineering applications? And if not, uh, what do you think we are currently missing that's keeping us from there? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, it's actual real world application of reinforcement learning is still in its infancy. Uh, it is used in a few places. Uh, so, um, but these are still kind of emerging technologies. So for example, the grasping system that I presented in the beginning, uh, there was actually uh, a news story that came out about, I think about half a year to a year ago from uh, X, uh, which is part of Alphabet, you know, formerly part, part of Google, uh, where they're actually using a, a variant of the system for robotic grasping for kind of trash sorting type applications. So they have a robot that's actually picking up uh, trash and sorting it into recyclables. Um, there are, um, uh, applications of reinforcement learning uh, that that have been explored in finance. A lot of this is stuff that don't, doesn't get talked about because fi finance companies tend to be pretty tight-lipped about how they're doing things. But that is one of the things that uh, that, that you know uh, they're exploring. Um, I'm sure there are other applications that are just on the horizon. Um, part of what makes uh, in kind of in real-world application of RL a bit difficult is that you have to like either have a very effective simulator or the ability to automate the real world data collection. And those are two things that have been pretty major barriers. Uh, another application I should mention is uh, uh, HVAC control for buildings for power efficiency, which is, uh, you know, a number of years back, there was a, a press release from uh, DeepMind discussing uh, applications for that. I see, uh, thank you. Um... I, I might uh, abuse my position here for a second and ask one of my own questions. Um, so I, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts, uh, so this is related to what I would guess would be hierarchical RL and compositionality. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on learning abstractions for high level reasoning slash, you know, do we need to inject symbols and inductive biases into systems or can these things just be learned end to end? Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good question. But that is kind of one of the big mysteries uh, in some ways uh, of the current, uh, you know, of our current age of AI, right? Is uh, 
-hmm. How do we get from, it, it, I can summarize maybe what you said is how do we go from low level reasoning to high level reasoning? And there, I don't have an answer for you on that. There are some very interesting competing viewpoints, right? Uh, one viewpoint, which I think is actually has, has a lot going for it. I don't know if it's right or not, but one viewpoint is that, well, if we can just figure out the low level stuff, maybe just doing more of that will get us to the high level stuff. And in some ways, that is the story that we saw, for instance, in computer vision, kind of the classical, you know, 2010 type uh, view of deep learning and vision is that if you figure out good low level features, just applying that layer by layer would eventually get you mid level features and higher level features. Um, and in vision that has, you know, kind of panned out uh, insofar as we believe that current computer vision systems do something higher level. Uh, on the other hand, it's very appealing to think about this kind of hierarchical view of decision making. It, it, you know, to us, it seems very natural that you figure out low level behaviors and then compose them at higher levels. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. It could be that neural nets are already hierarchical enough and maybe that's all, all we need. And maybe they're not, and there's some other hierarchical formalism that we that we need to figure out for. And we're exploring both directions, but we don't we don't know the answer right now. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so it looks like we might have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, the the next one, I think, um, yeah. So so this one says, uh, do you think that we need uh, innovative uh, new ideas to reach human capabilities, or could scaling be enough? as for example, uh, GPT-3 might suggest? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, an, another big mystery of, of, of our age in AI. Um, I, think, I think we do need something. And I, and, I, and I think that one of the reasons why I think that just scaling supervised learning in particular might not work is, is the embodiment problem. Is that I, I think that as long as you have systems that don't live in our world, they'll make mistakes that seem unreasonable to us. And, and, I, and I think that the results that, we, that we've seen, especially with language models, they're, they're really remarkable. Uh, but I also think that probing into that, we do see some of these like common sense weirdness, uh, you know, a little bit similar to the examples I gave in the, in the beginning of my talk. And I, and I think ultimately the only way to really patch them is to have a system that kind of understands the physical grounding of those things. Now, maybe understanding physical grounding is also just a matter of scale. I don't think that's out of the question. But it just has to be scaled kind of in the right direction, the direction where the system, you know, really gets to see and, and interact with the with the real world, whatever that real world might be. So real world doesn't mean robot necessarily. It could mean that it's an agent that interacts with humans via chat on the internet. That's still a kind of a real world, but I think it needs to have that that ground. I see. Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think I might just ask uh, one more question to close off. Uh, and I think uh, before I ask it, it, it's the perfect segue to, to mention that I, I believe that this talk is being recorded uh, if anyone would like to look back uh, to, through these resources. Um, so this is combining two questions on here. And uh, they're basically, one is, what is the best simulation to do evaluation and training of RL? I know Gazebo and OpenAI Gym, but not sure if there's something better in the community. And then somebody else asked uh, if you just have general tips on how someone that's new to the field can get started with reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of simulations, um, it's, it's a matter of, of kind of balancing fidelity and simplicity. In, in my research, uh, I'm a big fan of the Mujoko simulator, largely because it's very simple and easy to use. Uh, it, it, it's not open source, but there is a free license for, for anyone who wants to try it. And, uh, generally, Emma Todorov, who's the lead developer, is uh, you know pretty open-minded about that sort of thing. But he has a, a student license that that's free. Uh, Bullet, uh, all, the Bullet Physics Engine also has very nice simulation be benchmarks. So there's a, a Robo School, I believe it's called, is a pack package released by OpenAI that uses Bullet. So that could be a, a, a nice thing to get started with. But the other thing is that uh, you could also think about what problems are of interest to you. It's not that difficult to take a problem that, that you want to study if you have a, a nice simple simulation of it and wrap it in uh, in a standard kind of MDP interface based on OpenAI Gym uh, and just start playing with it. So consider also what problems you want to tackle. It might not be that hard uh, to make a little toy simulator for that. Uh, in terms of how to get started on reinforcement learning, um, so I, I teach a class on reinforcement learning at UC Berkeley and all of my lectures are, are online. Uh, and there are also a number of other online resources. So uh, there's an excellent series of lectures uh, by David Silver that, that's kind of a little bit more conceptual and theoretical in nature. 
there is a, a nice kind of online uh, repo, I think it's called uh, Spinning Up on DeepRL, uh, released by uh, Josh Akiem. So those are good resources to get started. Any one of those would probably do. Uh, my class is more focused on kind of a broader overview of all sorts of different RL topics. Uh, Dave's class, I think, is a little more focused on model free RL. So it's kind of a matter of uh, where you want to start first. I see. Uh, wonderful. So thank you so much for all of those resources. Um, and with that, I think we are all out of time. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, thank you so much again uh, for, for coming uh, on here, Sergey. Uh, it has been wonderful having you here. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, before we move forward, I'm just going to make one last uh, announcement uh, about the conference, uh, from which we'll move on to the next events. Um, so anyways, thank you everyone uh, for joining us uh, here today. Uh, this was the last keynote of RIA, uh, but it is not the end. We will have networking sessions. You can visit the sponsors booths in the expo section. And we have the closing social event called Circos that consists of panels proposed and organized by RIA attendees. We are very happy and thank you all for being a part of this event, which was built by a diverse group of people with the common goal of enhancing the AI ecosystem in Mexico and Latin America. We invite other communities of AI to reach out to us in order to create new alliances and increase momentum. One of the recent communities we met, we met was Hackify, based in Tijuana, Mexico, that has been running its virtual hackathon, Let's Hack Mexico, in parallel to RIA, and they will announce their winners on Sunday afternoon. Uh, and I believe uh, the final pitches will be made at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time uh, via Zoom. Uh, and I believe uh, we are sharing the link in the session chat uh, right now. Uh, finally, we want to thank our gold sponsors, uh, Google and Synergia CIS with IBM, uh, our silver sponsor, H2O.ai, and our bronze sponsors, computer, the Computer Science Department of no Northwestern University, the Berkeley EECS Department, and the Berkeley AI Research Lab, uh, Haddox, NVIDIA, ITAM, Microsoft, and Fuga de Cerebros by NDS Cognitive Labs. We would also like to thank our partners, SMIA, UNAM, Tech de Monterrey, and El Consorcio de Inteligencia Artificial Conacit. Uh, and with that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Um, we're going to go ahead and close this session off now. Uh, thanks so much again for joining us.